Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. Today we're going to be checking out this amazing infinite sum. Um, it's something that I've uh, I've thought about a lot and I've never really put much um, put much effort into solving but recently uh, it just popped into my head and I kind of played around with it and I actually figured out a really beautiful solution that I want to share with you guys. Um, the general way that this is solved is using Fourier analysis that's not something that I'm familiar with, so I'm using more traditional methods here. So uh, something interesting about the sinc function, uh, sinc of x equals sine x over x, um, and it's defined to be uh, 1 when x is 0. And the interesting thing about sinc is because of its properties in the Fourier domain, the integral from 0 to infinity of sinc of x is pi over 2, something that we've shown before. And also sine squared of x over x squared, also pi over 2, also something we've shown before. But interestingly, if you expand that to sums, the same actually holds true. So if you go from negative infinity to infinity of sinc of x, you're going to get pi pi. And same thing if you go from negative infinity to infinity of sinc squared of x, which is what we're going to show right here, you also get pi. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and prove this epic sum. So the first thing we're going to do is sort of reorganize this sum into three different parts. It's kind of symmetric around zero, but it does have that one term at zero that's a little bit interesting. So we have the sum from negative infinity to negative one of sinc squared of x, or sinc squared of n, plus one, which is that term at zero, which we are defining to be one, plus the sum from one to infinity of sinc squared of n. And if you notice, uh, sinc squared of n is clearly an even function since sinc is already even and we're squaring it. So that means that 2 times the sum from 1 to infinity of sinc squared of n equals pi minus 1. So if we go ahead and divide that by 2, all we need to prove is that this sum is equal to um, pi minus 1 over 2. And now we can go ahead and replace our normal formula. The reason I'm writing it as sinc is because sine of n over n, uh, when n equals 0, is completely undefined. And so, But with sinc, we have that value defined to be 1. And so that's why I'm using the sinc notation. But now we can just go ahead and use our normal notation. Let's go ahead and start evaluating this sum. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use our trig identities to go ahead and reorganize this sum. So we're going to bring out a 1 half sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus cosine of 2n all over n squared. That's just our basic um, double angle identity or power reduction, whatever you want to call it. And the next thing we're going to do is actually pretty interesting. We're going to write this bit right here as a, an expression of another variable. So we're going to introduce a new variable, which I'm going to call theta. And we're going to take cosine of theta. And if we evaluate cosine of theta at theta equals 0 and theta equals 2n, we're going to end up with this expression again. Because cosine, when theta equals 0, we're going to end up with just 1, and when theta equals 2n, we're going to subtract 2n. And as you can see here, I'm setting up to convert this expression into an integral of theta. So we can write this as 1 half times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the integral from 2n to 0. Now the derivative of cosine of theta with respect to theta is negative sine of theta d theta. And so if you see, if we do this integral, it's relatively easy to do. We'll end up back with this original expression up here. And that's the really cool thing about this 1 minus cosine of 2n because it's really just uh, easy to express it as an integral. Then we're going to go ahead and take this negative sign and just go ahead and reorganize this. So it looks nicer. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to exchange the order of summation and integration because it's going to be a lot easier to sum than it is to integrate. So 
well, actually, it's relative. It's super easy to integrate at this point, but we want to be able to sum something up and then um, integrate the result of that sum. The problem is right now, our integral, the bounds, have has some sort of n in it. It's from zero to two n. So we need to actually take that n outside of the bounds and put it inside the integral. So let me show you how we do that. Instead of the integral from zero to two n, we want to reorganize this integral so it goes from zero to one. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to say that theta equals 2n times some other variable, t. Now, notice that when t equals 0, theta equals 0 as well. And when t equals 1, theta equals 2n, which means that we can rewrite this as the integral from 0 to 1 of sine of 2n t. So this is going to mean that this is d theta equals 2n dt. And if we rewrite our integral, we're going to end up with one half the integral, or sorry, let's put the sum on the outside. And now when t equals zero and one, theta equals zero and two n. So that works out perfectly for us. And then we're going to have sine of two n t. And instead of dt, we'll have two n dt all over n squared. You can go ahead and cancel this one half with this two, and this n will cancel with this squared. And now, since our integral, um, our bounds and our differential don't have anything with respect to n, we can move them outside of our sum. So now we have the integral from 0 to 1 of the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of sine of 2nt over n dt. Now the sum is relatively easy to evaluate. The first thing we need to remember is that the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of x to the n over n equals negative ln 1 minus x. This is just found by integrating um, 1 over 1 minus x, which is the same as the integral of the uh, geometric series, right? So the reason this helps us is that sine of 2 nt is the same as just the imaginary part of e to the 2i t, two, sorry, 2n, two, two I, I guess, e to the 2i n t. And so if we re exchange this imaginary operator, because nothing else out here is imaginary or real, it's just, or nothing else in the sum is imaginary, we can just make that the imaginary part of the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of e to the 2i n t over n dt. Then we can rewrite this as e to the 2i t to the n. All right, now we can go ahead and evaluate that sum in exactly the same way that I showed you. So this is going to be negative ln 1 minus e to the 2i t. Um, because of the way the imaginary operator works, we can bring this negative outside because anything imaginary multiplied by negative one will just will it'll still be imaginary, right? The imaginary part of the natural logarithm is just the argument of the uh, input of the natural logarithm, right? So we can write this as negative the integral from zero to one of arg one minus e to the two it. And arg just means that the, the angle that the value makes um, in the complex plane. So something that's real has an argument of zero since it has no angle. Something that's imaginary is kind of, if you look at the complex plane, it's just uh, something that's imaginary would be on this line right here. And so that would be an, an argument of pi over two. And then it continues all the way over to this line where the argument would be pi. And then as we go this way, we actually flip back around. So as I said before, this is um, this would be an argument of zero. This would be an argument of negative pi over two. And so they sort of meet over here on the other side. And right here, we have a little bit of a cut where the argument switches from pi all the way to negative pi going clockwise or going counterclockwise. So let's rewrite this uh, using our exponential form. We can write this as the integral from 0 to 1 of arg of 1 minus cosine of 2t minus i sine of 2t. 
Now let's look at the real and imaginary parts of this function. First off, the real part will always be greater than zero. So we're in this part of the complex plane, right? That's because one minus cosine two t, it can never be less than zero, it can never be negative. And that means we can use a pretty simple formula for the argument, since we can see that tangent of the argument of z, if we go ahead and draw some point in the complex plane, this represents the imaginary part, this represents the real part, and this represents the modulus. We can see that tangent of theta, which is the same as tangent of the argument, is equal to the imaginary part. Just uh, simplifying this expression that we have here, arg z equals inverse tangent of imaginary part of z over the real part of z. And this is going to be really helpful to us because it means that we can reorganize our integral into something really, really simple. So if we go ahead and plug in our definition with arctangent that we just found, that we just uh, sort of derived, we're going to end up with arctangent of the imaginary part, which is negative sine of 2t, over the real part, which is 1 minus cosine of 2t. I'll just go ahead and cancel these negative signs because inverse tangent is an odd function. Then I'm going to go ahead and expand these according to trig identities. So this is going to become 2 sine t cosine t. And on the bottom, we can write this as 2 sine squared of t. You can go ahead and cancel these twos and then cancel one of these signs with one of these signs. And so we're going to end up with the integral from 0 to 1 of inverse tangent of cotangent of t. And this might look incredibly simple to deal with, and it is, but make sure you don't make any mistakes uh, with all these inverses because the inverse tangent of cotangent is not equal to 1 over t, as you might think, because sometimes I get confused with all the inverses. But we can really easily just use the formula inverse tangent of x plus inverse cotangent of x equals pi over 2, and that's just using the... Uh, reflection formula since tangent of x and cotangent of x take on the same values as one goes from 0 to pi over 2 and the other one goes from pi over 2 to 0. So that means we can write this as the integral from 0 to 1 of pi over 2 minus inverse tangent of or inverse cotangent sorry of cotangent of t dt inverse cotangent of cotangent of t at least on this domain, is going to pretty easily just be t. So I can just write that as t. And hopefully you guys can do this integral by yourselves and convince yourselves that it is in fact equal to pi minus 1 over 2. And that is what we were trying to prove that it was equal to because at the beginning we showed that, if, that since this sum is equal to pi minus 1 over 2, that implies that the sum from negative infinity to infinity of sinc squared of n is equal to pi. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I really enjoyed exploring the uh, cool methods that we used in this video. I really, uh, I really love the uh, thing where you can convert two terms that are subtracting each other into an integral with respect to another dummy variable. And then it actually took me a while to figure out that next step where you could kind of um, shift the bounds of the integral so that they didn't include n anymore. So that was really fun to deal with. I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome infinite sum and the video, and I'll see you next time. Bye.